Good evening and welcome to Impact 100 Philadelphia's Fall Education Event titled Financial Reset Racism, Your Money, Your Impact. My name is Giovanna Bell and I will be your host this evening. Welcome. I know tonight will be an insightful panel discussion and event. Um, I am the board chair for Impact 100's DEI Strategic Initiatives Committee, which aims to ensure that Impact 100 is a diverse, equitable, and inclusive organization. The committee aims to assist Impact 100's board of directors and members to understand, reflect, and respond to the growing need for diversity within our organization and also within our community in order to enhance our philanthropic impact. Tonight, I am joined by several esteemed guests and panelists who I would like to introduce to you shortly. But first, I want to tell you a little bit more about our organization, Impact 100 Philadelphia, for those who may be new to our nonprofit and its amazing impact. Impact 100 engages women in collectively funding high impact grants that address unmet needs in the Philadelphia region and raise the profile of smaller nonprofit organizations. Through this work, our goal is to make our community more just, equitable, and healthy for everyone. Since 2009, our women members have awarded more than four million in grants across five focus areas. Those areas include arts and culture, education, environment, family, health and wellness, and currently um, our diversity and membership is one of our highest priorities. Uh, the membership committee in conjunction with the DEI committee have embarked on a very exciting initiative to grow diversity in membership each year by at least 10% to ensure that our organization is reflective of our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our next fiscal and membership deadline is fast approaching, and we wanna make sure that you're aware that that deadline is November 15th. To become a member or donate to our organization, you can visit www.impact100philly.org uh, slash members <laughs> to join today. Uh, so please do not forget that that deadline is fast approaching November 15th. Now, let's get to the reason of why we are here. Thank you to our esteemed guests and panelists for participating in tonight's event. Special thanks to Impact 100 Philadelphia's Board of Directors, our new Executive Director and Programs Committee, and also members who have contributed to the success of tonight's program. Finally, we would like to also welcome new friends of Impact 100 who have joined us this evening. Welcome. We hope you enjoy tonight's program and that you'll learn more about our impactful organization in which we take great pride in. In short, tonight, we hope that you will see our why. First, I would like to introduce Jamila Harris Morrison, who is the Executive Director of Achievability, one of our 2021 grantees. The organization is located in West Philadelphia, where one in three residents live below the poverty line. Achievability's goal is to eradicate the cycle of generational poverty in Philadelphia. Achievability also utilizes a holistic approach to address the root causes of poverty by partnering with individuals to create a specific action plan to help them achieve their goals. To learn more about Achievability, please visit their website at www.achievability.org. Here to tell us more about Achievability is their executive director, Jamila Harris Morrison. Jamila? Hi, thanks, Joanna. Um, thank you to Joanna and the Impact 100 team for inviting me to join you this evening. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of Impact 100, and I really appreciate the work that you're doing in activating women in the region to make our city a better place. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about achievability and our experience with Impact. So. I was, as Joanna said, I'm Jamila Harris Marson. I lead Achievability. We're a West Philly-based nonprofit dedicated to ending poverty for Philadelphia families. We've been serving residents for over 40 years, and we've been really proud to partner with Impact 100 this year to strengthen families. As many of you may know, Philly is a tale of two cities. While there is an abundance of resources, wealth, and opportunity, unfortunately, at 26%, Philly has maintained the distinction of having the highest poverty rate of the 10 largest cities 
And that rises by 40% in the communities that we serve. For families, this translates to a wealth gap where white households have a median net worth of almost $200,000 and black households with a mere $25,000. When you see these stats, it's, it's astonishing to understand how staggering our current reality is. But it's also helpful to understand how we got there. So financial racism shows up in all of our, well, racism shows up in all of our systems, but you know, financial systems are not exempt. Um, the impact of past and current discriminatory financial practices are unfortunately institutionalized in our DNA today. Take redlining, for example. With the stroke of a pen, this became one of the most destructive policies to black families. Redlining determined where, family, where black families could live, with us often being relegated to undesirable neighborhoods or shut out of the home ownership process altogether. This has led to Philadelphia having deep racially and geographically concentrated poverty. The inability of black families to participate in the American dream has limited wealth building opportunities, access to education and lifetime earning potential. Can you imagine that the location of your home even determines your health outcomes, including how long you might live? As a result of redlining, black families have been robbed of generations of wealth, and these policies have created the conditions that negative, negatively impact the families we serve. This is just one example of how financial racism is at play in our society and why the task of moving families out of poverty can be so complex and overwhelming. We're not just seeking to address the conditions of today, but also to dismantle the hundred years of oppressive policies and practices. At Achievability, we fight poverty through our three core programs. Achievability Connects, the Family Self-Sufficiency Program, and Work Smart West Philly. Each year, we have the pleasure of serving over 2,800 individuals and families. Achievability Connects is our largest serving program, helping to stabilize families in West Philadelphia. Through this program, we support families with emergency rental assistance for rent, utilities, and transportation. We provide basic need support, such as diapers, food, and hygiene products. And we help parents build skills through digital literacy and job training. And of course, we help families become first-time homeowners with financial education and matching support. With support from, one, from Impact 100, we're looking to expand our capacity by 25% to help, ser help us serve 700 more families. We are really proud to be awarded one of the core grant um, awardees this year alongside four other finalists in the region. As you can imagine, beyond achievability in our sector, these services are needed more than ever in light of COVID-19. There's a lot of work to be done and it takes a village to end poverty in this region, but we know that we can do it. And we know that you can help us make a difference in that process. And there are lots of ways for you to get involved. You heard from Joanna today, you can join Impact 100, who is doing phenomenal work with supporting organizations that are on the front lines, helping families to overcome poverty. You can invest in BIPOC organizations. A Philadelphia study titled How African-American-Led Organizations Differ, Differ from White-Led Organizations highlighted that African-American-led organizations serve the neediest populations with the least amount of resources and also struggle with access to key social networks, which can negatively impact access to funding. Where you put your dollars really matters. You can also make a difference by educating your village, whether that's your family, your colleagues, your neighbors, your faith-based group. Everybody needs to know ways that they can get involved to make this world a better place. And finally, you can, sub you can get involved and make a difference by supporting policies that promote racial and financial equity. So that's a little bit for you to chew on. Uh, this is a phenomenal organization for you to get involved with, and we're really proud to partner with Impact and the team over the next 18 months. I thank you for your time and your investment in making Philly a better place for all, and look forward to connecting with some of you soon. Take care and have a good evening. Thank you, Jamila. That was amazing. The work you and your team do at Achievability is vital for our community, and we are so proud to have you as a grantee. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to turn to our educational event for this evening. At Impact 100, we are always trying to broaden our thinking and to improve the impact we have as philanthropists. Tonight, we are happy to present a discussion on financial racism, and I would like to now introduce our panelists as well as our moderator for this evening. Adina Abramowitz is the Managing Partner of Community Development Financial Institutions, which is also abbreviated as CDFI, Friendly America. 
She is one of the nation's leading consultants for CDFIs based on her experience as a CEO of a small business and her formative role in industry capacity building. She founded Consulting for Change in January 2006 to provide services supporting strategic and operational planning, market analysis and product development, organizational assessment, leadership development, executive coaching, as well as organizational change in nonprofit organizations. Next up, I have Mark Pinsky, who developed the CDFI Friendly Model and is founding partner of CDFI Friendly America. He is a noted strategist, author, and advisor on public purpose, finance, and in 2019, he co-authored Organize Money, uh, the new press with Keith Mech. He is a leader in the CDFI industry. Uh, just starting in 1992, he played key roles in transforming industry innovations ranging from the CDFI fund to the equity equivalent investment product to the ARIS or AERIS rating system. To learn more about this organization, uh, CDFI Friendly America, please visit their website, which is www.cdfifriendlyamerica.com. So thank you, Adina and Mark, for being with us this evening. Next, I am going to introduce our moderator for this evening's program, which is Sue Howard-Leitner, a second year impact member, as well as the vice president of finance for Johnson & Johnson Pharmaceuticals. Sue provides strategic finance planning and management leadership, as well as oversight to Johnson & Johnson's innovation, and has also worked in both the pharmaceutical consumer health sectors uh, throughout her career. Without further ado, I would like to turn it over to our moderator for this evening, Sue. So Sue, please take it away. Well, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. I know we were having a few audio uh, issues earlier, um, but I wanted to uh, tell you really quickly about the chat feature. It sounds like a lot of you have already used it, which is perfect. And we'd like to continue that. So I'll be monitoring the chat box while Mark and Adina um, do their presentation. And feel free questions they're going to ask you as well. And then I'll try to moderate as we go. So without further ado, Mark and Adina, take it away. Thank you, Sue. Thank you for that introduction. Um, thank you, Joanna, for setting the stage for this discussion tonight. And uh, Jamila, thank you so much for your inspiring work, um, which represents, um, I, I think, a, a really great thing about Philadelphia, our ability to, to um, make lives better for folks. So um, we're going to talk tonight about financial racism, your money, your impact. There are a couple messages that um, I want to begin with um, as we get started, and Adina and I will go back and forth in the presentation tonight. Um, the first is financial racism has been the, the sort of the subject of the work that I've done for almost my entire career for 35 years or so. Um, and it is a, it's a topic that I think you'll find the more you think about it, the more you look at it, the more you understand it, the more you see it and the more you recognize the incredibly powerful and influential force it's, um, it's played in not only my life, but all of our lives. Um, and I certainly have come to understand over the years the, the extent to which it has uh, privileged me and it has disadvantaged others. So um, we hope that one of the things you take away tonight is the ability to really think about financial racism, which is often hidden in plain sight. The second message we really want you to take away is that um, it very directly through Impact 100 Philadelphia and indirectly through all the choices you make in your financial life, your money has impact and you can make some choices that can make your impact greater or less. Um, and so we hope that we'll give you some resources. You may know of some others. Um, we aren't going to be able to cover the whole topic tonight, but we are going to try to give you um, a framework in which you can understand financial racism. We look forward to the conversation. So, Adina. Thank you. Okay, so here's our agenda for tonight. We've already done the introductions and overview. Um, we're going to talk about how the financial system and racism, how they unfortunately are go hand in hand with one another. Um, and we're gonna give you both some, ex some a few statistics, we're gonna tell a few stories, and we're gonna explain what is structural and what is systemic about, race, about the financial system and racism. Um, we're also gonna talk a little bit about the language of the financial system and how racism is embedded in that, in, even in the language, um, and how it analyzes things. 
Then the next section, so that's the bulk of what we want to talk about today. And then we're going to talk about what we call asset activism. In other words, what can you do with your assets, your money to combat the um, ra- financial racism? Um, and how can you invest both use your money that you're that you use to spend as well as the money you use to invest to create more positive impact. And we'll end it with discussion and questions and answers. Okay, so here's just some, a very few facts on the ground of where we are today. Um, If you look at wealth, which is, you know, how much assets do you have compared to how much liabilities you as a household have? Um, The average white household has $8 $8 for every $1 that the average African-American household has. Um, if you look at, um, at that same statistic for Latinos, it's five to one. Um, if you look at, if you want to refinance your house, you know, rates go down and it would be advantageous to refinance your house. Um, black families are rejected on a rate of twice as much as white families for mortgage refinancing. Um, and if you look at, Um, If you look at equal property values across different communities, uh, black neighborhoods and Hispanic neighborhoods, those homeowners pay more in their property taxes, 10 to 13 percent more. And we've also found out that appraisals are incredibly different. You can put the same house, uh, have a a last name that seems like an African-American name. It will appraise lower than the exact same house if if it's Smith or some other typical white name. So these are just a few facts. There's many, many more we could quote, but just to get us started. Next slide, please, Dave. Back to you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Adina. So we want to be really specific. Um, The language of structural and systemic racism, structural and systemic this, structural and systemic that, is, um, is often used without real understanding. And we want to try and be really particular. When we talk about structural racism, we're talking about things that are, are, are um, baked into the laws and the regulations um, of how we work. They're, they're how things are, how the, rule, the rules by which we are sort of asked to play or expected to play in some ways. And when we talk in just a minute about systemic, um, it's how we actually play the game. Um, and sometimes we play by the rules and sometimes we don't play by the rules. Um, but those two things we want to distinguish. So, for example, when we're talking about structural um, uh, racism, um, the National Mortgage Act. If you look to the right there, that's a that's a map of a um, redlining map of Philadelphia from the 1930s when redlining first became a uh, a, le- a formal and legal part of our of our financing system. Um, and you can look at that and imagine Philadelphia as you see it today, um, and you may see some correlation at least in some parts of it. Um, and that came out of the National Mortgage Act of the 19 of the 30s. Um, one one thing that I don't want to mention that I didn't include here that I do want to mention. Um, that is another example is the Homestead Act of 1862 is, I've learned recently, was an incredibly uh, racist way of creating wealth um, where families were given free land, about 160 acres of free land west of the Mississippi, um, really across the Great Plains um, and to the, as far as the Rocky Mountains um, for free if they went there and settled it. And anyone could qualify as long as they were a citizen, according to the Citizen Act, National Citizen Act of 1790, which, oh, by the way, only recognized white people. And so there, there were many, many, many millions of dollars of wealth that were created as a result of people owning that land and their ability, whatever they did with it, um, that was simply denied to, to not only the slaves, but to even to the what free black people there were at the time. So, um, you know, it's just a, it's the way that the legacy of that really carries on. If we can go to the next slide, um, the actual practices um, that are systemic, we talked a little bit about redlining. Um, we talk, you know, preferential customer treatment is a blatant, um, um, illegal, but blatant practice um, in much of finance, not all finance. Um, and we have this notion, which I think we're now beginning to, uh, people are beginning to ask good, hard questions about, about what, what sort of, um, you know, how, 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 how much we've defined success in this country as a, as a sort of European model and how that has um, discriminated against others. So um, we can come back and talk more about any of this stuff. We don't want to dwell on it, but we wanted you to understand structural is are the rules by which we're, we're told to play and uh, systemic or how we actually play the game. So, Adina. So we want to talk about how did you get your first home? 
And Mark and I are going to tell our stories, each of our stories, um, both of which illustrate different components of how being white um, privileged us into home ownership in a way that we wouldn't have otherwise. We, but we want you to, um, at the same time, we welcome you putting in the chat your story of how you, uh, your household, if you, have, if you have purchased a home, how, how did that come about? How were you able to do that? So in my family, the story goes back to um, my wife, Naomi. She was married to a man before me, um, and he, his father owned property in Camden, New Jersey. And he was, um, he was an owner of a dry cleaning store. And as that was successful, he bought other properties that, were, that he rented out. I mean, I think it would not be inappropriate to say that he was a slumlord. Um, and that, in fact, um, and over time, he, he accumulated many, many properties. So that when he passed away and um, an inheritance reached my, um, uh, the family that my wife was part of, they bought a very nice suburban home in Media, Pennsylvania. Um, and then when Naomi and her husband split, that's the money that um, allowed her to buy a home and then allowed us to buy a home in Mount Airy that we still live in today. So that's the sort of a generational legacy. Um, and then, you know, all of our children own homes. And all of this comes from Sam, the dry cleaner in Camden, New Jersey. He was the person who created was able to create the wealth that allows all of us to be homeowners. Let me tell my father's story or my parents' story. My father was a veteran in World War II and in the late 1940s, he was able to buy a home in Indiana um, with the help of the GI Bill. And although the GI Bill did provide some benefits to black veterans, it provided far less, roughly three, three to one uh, advantage to white folks. Um, and, and, and so it was easier for him to get a mortgage and he got a better mortgage deal um, and he was able to take the money that he earned from owning that house and the equity he took away from that house and put a down payment on a house when he moved to the Philadelphia area. He was a, my parents were original residents of Levittown, Pennsylvania, which many of you probably know um, was created with race restricted deeds. Um, you could only sell to white families and only white families could live there. And although it's not a proud moment for my family and although my family worked hard for the integration of Levittown and, and was active in that, it, it allowed us to create wealth that, that uh, some of which I've inherited and some of which has made it possible for my wife and me to buy our first home in, in uh, Bucks County with a loan from my parents um, and, uh, and, and to be able to continue to accrue equity that's allowed us to live now in Chestnut Hill. So um, it, it, is a, it was a huge factor in shaping my life. Okay, so it, it looks like from the chat, there's definitely a theme of, of gifts um, whether it be partial down payments, you know, um, gifts from families, as well as a couple of like FHA type loans or, or some of the housing incentives, substantial gifts from in-laws. Now I'm still waiting for that. So I love some of these. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. So I think the point of the story is one of the points of this story is that in America, we have this very powerful myth of lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. But the reality is, is that for most white people, a lot of their wealth is not because of bootstraps. It's because of inheritance or advantages that we got because of who we are. Um, and um, so not that there aren't people who haven't done that and not that I don't honor that, but it's, it's, a, it's largely a myth. Most of us had advantages like my parents went to Brooklyn College that cost like $20 a credit, things like that, that we were able to take advantage of. So let's... Go to the next slide, please. Thank you, Sue. So now we want to talk a little bit about what does the financial system lift up or honor and what does it put down? What does it not respect so much? And some of this has to do with language. Some of this has to do with how it, what, what is a value when it analyzes a loan. So let's go to the next slide. So the, here's the thing about language. Um, banks talk about trusts and safes and securities these who wouldn't want their money to be someplace that they trusted and that was safe and that was secure and that was bonded all those things sound so great but it uh, that's and i'm not criticizing any of that but what it it puts down is our loans that don't have security behind them which is often what we need working capital loans or loans to give us a first chance 
It doesn't value transparency, things that are easy to understand. All loan documents are in less than nine point type and go on for pages and pages of words we never heard of before. It doesn't value simplicity. So next slide, please. So another thing that our, our system values is single family home ownership way above people who rent or live in multifamily housing, which is very different than Europe or other parts of the world where most people live in rental and multifamily housing and don't accumulate, accumulate a lot of their wealth in home ownership. And part of what that has resulted in in America is a huge affordable housing problem because values of housing are just way out of control in many, in many neighborhoods and in many markets. Next slide, please. So when, uh, when um, people come forward and ask for a loan the first, or ask for even a deposit account, the first thing you have to do is provide a social security number. And anybody who um, was born in the United States is able to get a social security number. But people who are here who are immigrants or refugees don't have social security numbers. They have ITINs. Even if they're here totally legally, until they become citizens, it's hard to get a social security number. So they have this other kind of number, and that's how they pay taxes, but it makes it much harder for them to get a loan. Most banks will, and many other financial institutions will not lend money to people with ITINs. Next slide, please. So another way of thinking, how do we analyze loans? We privilege wealth, which is assets in the bank or assets, you know, or illiquid assets, things that we own, and it devalues cash flow, the money that's coming in. And in reality, what pays off a loan? Cash flow, not wealth. We don't usually want to sell something off to pay off a loan. We want to use the money that comes through uh, that, that we're earning to pay our loans. So that's kind of upside down. Next slide, please. And then there's a play on words we want to talk about that uh, the word equity, um, financial equity is wealth. It is um, the money that is not owed to anybody else. Whereas social and economic equity is fairness, is um, um, everybody on an equal playing field, which is very different than financial equity, but somehow it's the same word. Next slide, please. Okay, Mark, we're gonna, so that was the section about a little bit about financial racism. Now we're gonna talk about, and believe me, we could talk about this for hours and hours, but this is the amount of time we have tonight. Um, please feel free to think about your questions and put any of them in the chat and we'll get to those a little later. Uh, but now Mark's gonna talk a little bit about, so okay, this is the reality that we live in, what can we do about it? What's asset activism? And what we hope you, you're do, you've you done is taken away some of the ideas here and started thinking about them as you've seen them in your life or your work um, or, you know, as you go about your day. Um, because what we want everybody to know is um, that you have, it, as we said, your money, your, money, your impact, um, you can be an asset activist um, and you're doing it certainly just by being here tonight with Impact 100 Philadelphia and by making commitments. Um, to uh, core organizations like Achievability. Um, there is there's a website I suggest you check out if you want to think about, um, in a broad sense, if you want to think about whether the, the financial institution, particularly the bank that you bank with, um, how, they, how they prioritize uh, uh, sort of social impact in a broad sense. Um, and MightyDeposits.com is a big database that allows you to look bank by bank broadly at what the bank says it's doing in its community. Um, and they organize it. You, you know, you can look by racial equity. You can look by environment. You can look by all sorts of ways. So um, it's a site that that it's it's certainly fascinating to look at. I want to be really honest about it. It's it's a broad measure. It's not a it's not a really precise measure, but it may be useful to you. And and feel free to uh, look at MightyDeposits.com and go into your bank next time you're in there and talk. If you go into the bank, who goes in the bank? Or call the bank, and um, you know, ask them about what they do in a particular area. Another thing that people, some people feel strongly about is, is uh, doing their depository services with credit unions rather than banks. Credit unions are member cooperatively owned institutions. Um, they tend to be um, um, a, little bit, a little bit less expensive than banks in most areas, not all areas, but a lot of people like them because they're, they're community cooperatives in some ways. So that's an idea. And then broadly, the category of socially responsible banks, I want to actually give a shout out to minority depository institutions, which are too few in this country, mainly because it's been really hard to raise the capital, the equity, 
to be able to capitalize the banks and be able to compete in many ways. But there are, there are now significant efforts underway to try to bring more capital to minority depository institutions, which include both credit unions and banks. Um, and they are, if you're interested in that, that's, a, that's an area really to watch because I think they become increasingly important. Um, for those of you who have uh, money that's invested, whether it's for retirement or other purposes, there are more and more mainstream options for socially responsible investing, sometimes called ESG, environmental, social, and government, governance um, uh, funds, and other approaches. Some are just green funds. There are a lot of options now, so if you want to do that, you can. What's lagging behind that most of all, though, is socially responsible investings that really get at racial equity. One of the things that's been really fascinating to watch, although it hasn't played out yet, is that through, um, you know, the, over the last couple of years, especially since the murder of George Floyd, there have been a, an incredible number of financial institutions that have pledged to put money, create funds and create ways for people to put money into black owned businesses or black communities. Um, they have not yet come to fruition. And Wall Street Journal ran a story not long ago saying that, um, you know, most of that money isn't yet showing up and we'll see if it does. Um, but um, the, so there will be options. Impact investing is generally high net worth individuals who really want to control their own, the impact that they're having and are able to invest in any of a number, all the same categories, including racial equity. Um, one of the things that's happened to impact investing over the last couple of years through COVID and, um, and through the rise of Black Lives Matter and the racial equity world uh, movement is that more and more money has gone to CDFIs. And I'm going to pause we talk, well, we, when we were introduced, we were introduced as being part of something called CDFI Friendly America. So I'm going to take just a minute, Adina, to, to introduce a little bit about CDFIs, because that's, that's where we both put our careers in trying to make racial equity a reality in the financial services industry. And pro some progress, but I wouldn't call it success yet. CDFIs are private financial institutions that um, exist in various forms and exist in all 50 states and urban, rural, and native communities. Um, they are relatively small. The entire industry today is probably about $240 billion. And, um, you know, the, the, the biggest banks are over $3 trillion. So um, you get a sense of what they're doing. But they're incredibly good leverages. They're incredibly good at making finance work in, in disinvested, under-resourced communities because that's what they set out to do and managing the risk. And in the process of doing that, they're very good at leveraging mainstream money, bank money, other sources of capital, into those communities and putting together the people in those communities and the community needs with the mainstream economy. So um, they are incredibly um, important. And generally, you can invest in them either by get, making grants or by making loans or investments that, that revolve and keep giving so that it's not just a one time and it's used up, but that it, it gets paid back, it gets loaned out, it gets paid back, it gets loaned out, it gets paid back. We can go back to the slide, Dave, if you want to. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about CDFIs in a second. The Community Reinvestment Act is the 1977 law that, that uh, made redlining illegal. It's still common, but it was made illegal. And it has, uh, there's, a, there's a national movement to enforce community reinvestment, the Community Reinvestment Act, particularly when banks are merging or acquiring another bank, which is when it really comes into play. And the, and the community organizations that have done that have leveraged, um, you know, oh gosh, I don't even know the number, billion, probably a trillion dollars or more. Um, from banks over time to invest into communities. It's been an incredibly powerful tool. Um, and yet, redlining continues. Um, philanthropy, there are different ways to think about philanthropy. I'm all for um, um, you know, using your philanthropy, and I know that's a key thing for you here, investing in uh, services that are vital to communities. We need to do that. We also, um, Adina and I, we've talked about this, are big fans of the Philadelphia Bail Bond, um, which is you make a grant to it, but it's then using it's money to help people who are um, who lack access to capital or cash to be able to get a cash bond um, and so get stuck in prison sometimes for years on, on the most ridiculous minor charges. And it's simply for lack of having the wealth to, to be able to, to get out. So the bail bond steps in and does that. It has a, a, a um, disproportionately positive, a disproportionately um, equitable impact on um, people of color. So we're good at that. And then everybody thinking about their estate um, likes to think about your legacy. And it's an opportunity as you plan your estate to really think about um, what you want to support, um, you know, what you want your legacy to be and what you've supported. So I, those are just some of the areas. We're happy to come back. I imagine you'll have questions and talk about any or all of them. We want to take just a second, Dave, if we can go to the next slide. 
to talk about CDFIs. There are 10 CDFIs in the Philadelphia region. Some are very small and very concentrated. Some are actually national organizations, reinvestment fund, for example. Some are regional organizations like Community First Fund. Um, some like the Entrepreneur Center and Entrepreneur Works, um, Women's Opportunity Resource Center are really focused on microcredit, providing um, that working capital that Adina talked about that enables folks to get their start and um, to get a little bit of traction with a goal of helping them with a lot of support, you know, all the support they need of helping them, um, you know, grow and eventually we think become bankable. Um, that's a major goal. Some of them, including some of the ones I just mentioned, Community First Fund, Entrepreneur Fund, um, uh, North Philadelphia Financial Partnership, West Philadelphia, all have major focuses on racial equity and are working very hard um, to use their resources and develop. In fact, some of them, Community First Fund is a national leader in how CDFIs can can work towards racial um, racial equity in what they do. It's an uphill battle, but um, there are some real leaders here. And I would note that you know included in this group are some CDFIs that are looked to nationally, including Reinvestment Fund, Community First Fund, Entrepreneur Center, as really major innovators in trying to lead the way. So all of these are options you can think about, whether it's to impact 100 Philadelphia or whether it's in your personal um, decision making. We we are we come from the CDFI world. We believe in the CDFI world, and we wanted to make sure you have that list. Um, I think that's it, Dave. We'll go to the next one. All right, so we are on to the Q and A participation portion of of tonight. Um, as you can see, I am frozen in time. Uh, so this is the, the general wonders of technology. So I've been told I have a face for audio. So this is kind of my joke about that. Um, having some audio, some video issues. So I am frozen in time, but I'm live on voice. Um, so it would be great as Jill put in to, to put some questions in the chat. And, um, while we are waiting for some of the questions, Adina and Mark, I'll start us off, um, with the first question. So in listening to a lot of the different options that you've talked about and also some of the issues facing um, some of these organizations and, and people in general, how do you suggest we apply what you shared tonight or, or what are some tips that you've shared tonight that we should apply to our women's collective give impact grant making model? I guess I would start out with, and you may already do this, um, I would start out with the <laughs> idea that um, Racial equity be a lens through which you examine everything you do. Um, it's um, without that, it's very difficult to address these issues. So you might think about who leads the organizations. You might think about who's on the boards of these organizations. You might consider who's, um, you know, what kind of programs they have and outreach they have. And, and the, but most of all, what impact do they actually have? What changes are they making in the lives of people of color and um, in terms of improving um, equity. Um, we would encourage you to consider also uh, looking at organizations that are directly trying to, to work on the issues of, of um, financial racism, like achievability. That was really inspiring to hear from Jamila earlier. Um, so, you know, there are all different ways to address that issue and we need, we need many strategies. It's not any one strategy that's gonna solve this problem. And, and I want to I want to add to that um, by actually looking back to the history of what's now a very successful CDFI industry, just to tell very briefly the story of uh, the beginnings of the industry, which were which came from women collaborating. Um, it came from orders of women religious um, who got together in the late 1970s and early 1980s and wanted to figure out what they could do with their money, which was pooled collectively earned money. There was no Nobody gave them any money. They, they earned it. They used that money to pay for, for their health care, for the living costs, for the food, for the transportation. Everybody pulled their money and, and they made collective decisions about it. And one of the, what they saw, which before anybody else did, was they saw that if they could find a way to put their money into these things that weren't yet called CDFIs or Community Development Financial Institutions, they could create a, a, a way for people to put their money to work that would continue working for generations, or as the sisters said, long went long after they're gone, um, and they had an incredible amount of vision, and they are they remain active to this day, um, the women religious, and they are in many ways the real heroes of what's been a very successful CDFI industry over the past past thirty years. So I think there's a there's a there's a um, 
precedent to what you do. And I think that, that that can be an inspiration to you. I hope it's an inspiration to you. It certainly is to me. Great. No, thank you very much. Um, I think that was really good color. I also think we have a couple uh, thoughts in the, in the chat box about sharing the slides and then sharing the list of CDFIs um, with the group. If you guys wouldn't mind doing that after the fact, we can post them. Absolutely. Of course. That would be great. Okay. Um, question from one of the people in the chat is there's so many not-for-profits in Philly who are working to address the questions of equity. I worry that our efforts are too diffuse or diluted. How can we be sure that we are really having an impact? Great question. Uh, you know, I, I'll respond to that and say that I think it, 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 it's somewhat of a personal decision and that's where the collaboration comes in, where you get to share what's important to you and what you're trying to do. I think, I, I, you know, most nonprofits I've ever dealt with in Philadelphia, certainly most CDFIs I've ever dealt with in Philadelphia, would be really, um, would really welcome the opportunity to, to sort of talk with you about how they think they're making an impact. You have to have a theory of impact. You have to have a way you think you're making a difference. Um, and everybody, every, anybody who pretends there are all the answers is going to be wrong. But folks who are very targeted and understand what their role is and how they collaborate with others are more likely to be organizations that are that are creating a systemic, if not a structural, but a systemic um, sort of means of creating impact. And so, you know, everybody's got to make their own individual decisions. But that's what I would look for: is who 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 is leveraging what they are and what they do with other partners um, to to magnify and amplify their impact. Well, one one thing. Thanks, Mark. One thing I would like to say that I like about the Impact One Hundred approach is that you don't give out a ton of tiny little grants, which that would be very diffused. You you make some bets, some serious bets, and give fairly large amounts of money uh, to a few organizations. And I think that has much more of an impact um, and uh, is able to, um, has the potential of allowing an organization to really try something that they might otherwise not have been able to. So that I think that strat, I want to just um, commend you for that strategy. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, great. No, I, I was going to say, just being somebody who's experienced this for the first year, I would have to say the same thing. I love our bets are big and are, they're bold. And, you know, you, you heard yes. already today of, of one of the recipients and how, how amazing that is to get a lump sum and, you know, an amount that'll make a difference. So that's great. Yeah. And I would just say that achievability is all the proof in the world that you're, you're going to make good, good choices when you all work together to find out what the best way to use your money is, because it's, it's extraordinary. Wow. Well, that is a great place. I don't see any other questions. Well, actually, I do. Never mind. Uh, you know, a couple other quick um, one more thing as I'm going up is uh, there are three pillars of corporate sustainability, economic, environmental and social. Financial racism is also being experienced, being experienced as environmental racism. What are your thoughts on that? When I worked in Camden, that was a, a long time ago, many years ago. And I noticed right away that in Camden, in Camden County, they managed to put all the prisons in the city of Camden. They managed to put the trash to steam plant in the city of Camden. They, I mean, everything that was unfortunate and dirty and polluting was in the city of Camden. Um, so, yeah, that's a problem. That's a big challenge. Um, and I, you know, more and more um, community development financial institutions are looking at things through the lens of environment and climate change as well as as um, environmental racism. And I think we need to be um, we need to have our eyes open to all these components. And and one of the things I want to just add to that is, you know, when you when you have wealth, you have power. You just do. And so when you can organize that wealth, you can organize power. And so environmental racism is often a result of um, people of color not having the power to, to stand up. In Philadelphia right now, in Southwest Philadelphia, there's a major uh, discussion going on around the old, uh, you know, now decommissioned oil um, depot, I don't know what else to call it, refinery, um, where the community is working very hard to make sure that there's appropriate cleanup and that the, that the property is used in a way that's safe and good for the community and not just turned into another industrial site that's gonna take away from the community. So I, I just encourage you to look into that um, if you're interested in pursuing a sort of environmental racism um, giving strategy. Yeah, great. Um, one 
question that was in the chat that, that I think is interesting. And the first time I had heard about financial racism, I had the same question about, you know, people loosely hear about these concepts and you think you know what it means. You've heard of redlining, as you guys talked about. But many people still say, you know what, people of color should just pull themselves up by their bootstraps. How do we get that message out more and get people to understand systemic structural racism? You know, continue a word like, like you guys are doing. Any other thoughts or, or like a response to that question? Let me, uh, let me, let me go ahead, Adina. Ask them how they bought their first home. I thought that was really interesting because I, I agree. Yeah. You saw it in the chat here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I, I, a long time ago, I took a workshop with a group called United for a Fair Economy, and you might want to look them up. United for a Fair Economy talks about all the different ways that certain people had privilege and other people's did not, like, you know, my parents being able to go to Brooklyn College, like, you know, the, um, you know, the ability to buy a home through the GI Bill or all these different ways that we were able to move Pull, you know, seemingly pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, but we were actually, some of it was through our own effort. I'm not saying we didn't do, didn't work hard, but some of it was because we were given advantages. And, and just a couple of things. One reference book I'm actually reading now, it's a terrific book about that, is Heather McGee has written a book called The Sum of Us. Um, it's a terrific book that rebuts the idea that it's an either or, that either, you know, white people gain or you know, white people, if white people gain, black people lose. It's that everybody that we do better together. And uh, in uh, 2020, last year, a little over a year ago, actually, about a year ago, um, Citibank, one of the largest banks in the world, came out with a report that found that the that by failing to be inclusive of uh, black people in America, in the economy, in a bunch of ways, had cost us, uh, it was about $16 trillion dollars over 20 years and that um, on an annual basis going forward it was about $5 trillion a year by failure to be sort of inclusive in some ways. Um, and that's not a direct answer to the question of um, how do you, how do you just, how do you argue with someone who says, you know, come on, people just lift yourself up. But it is evidence that, that that's not what's happening in this country. That doesn't work. Um, and that um, we need to, we need to find a way, um, we need to find a way to make, racial uh, equity, a financial and economic reality, if we're going to be able to move forward as a healthy country. Um, so, and I, I will just, I'll use that actually that as a, a great pitch. But can I, let me just add one more thing, if I can, Sue, which is just that the book that I wrote that you heard about earlier called Organized Money is really about how the financial system works and how it works, um, you know, for one side and not the other. And um, I raised that, uh, you know, happy to talk about the book, but um, really, the important thing is people need to think about the financial system and not just the financial products. And we have a we have a tremendous deficit of understanding how the financial system works in this country. So that's a that's a major area of study for anybody who wants to take it on. I'm done. And Thanks. I think that's a, a great that's great. It's a great place to end. And I think, you know, if we kind of leave ourselves with the sentiment of better together, I think that's really key because, you know, we all we all benefit when each of us benefits. And I think that's great. So with that, Adina and Mark, I want to sincerely thank you for your time today, your time pre preparing for, for this um, seminar. And I would like to turn it back to Giovanna at this point. Thank you, Sue. And thank you again to our guest speakers, Jamila, Adina, and Mark. Also, friends, I would like to remind you that this is the time of year when we ask women to join Impact 100 Philadelphia. As mentioned earlier, our deadline is fast approaching. Um, so as we pull our money each year, uh, each member pays about 1150 each, or half of that for women under 36. And together, we decide where we want to allocate those funds to have the highest impact in our community. The more members we have by November 15th, the more support we can give to the wonderful nonprofits in our community. I would like to extend a huge thank you to those of our members who have already renewed for this year. And we invite all who haven't renewed yet to do so tonight. If you're not yet a member of Impact 100, we would like to have you join us in collective giving. We also encourage everyone to spread the word to friends as well as colleagues and family. Our membership committee can also help you in spreading this information as well and also provide an informational session to help you understand more about what Impact 100 is and how our funds are appropriately allocated. 
We want to continue to grow so that we can continue to give money to nonprofits and more of the nonprofit community learns about the grant opportunities of Impact 100 Philadelphia. Before we say goodnight, I want to provide some information on what lies ahead for Impact 100 Philadelphia. Our members are encouraged to register for our next Impactful Conversation program on October 14th, and there is an information session for anyone who is interested in becoming a member on October 20th. Both events will be held virtually. Following the November 15th membership deadline, we will announce our grant pool during the first week of December. Last year was a very exciting year as we raised over $420,000 in grant funds, and we want to be able to actually exceed that in this year. Please stay tuned for details of the funding celebration, which we hope to hold in person. The grants team is working very hard to meet the needs of both our members as well as our grantees. This year, our FAC meetings will again be held virtually, which allows us the opportunity for greater participation. We hope that the site visits can continue again in person, of course, but this allows for more comprehensive assessment of the, of the organizations to which we fund. Please refer to our newsletters as well as our website for more information. Again, I want to encourage you to go to our website and join tonight. If you are a existing member, please renew your membership. If you are uh, someone who is new with us this evening on the webinar, we would love if you can join us and um, sign up for membership tonight. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We know these virtual events often don't give members an opportunity or guests a chance to meet and connect as we would if we were in more normal times. But eventually, we hope to get to know you better. As we say goodbye to you this evening, we ask all of you to unmute yourselves for a big round of applause for our speakers tonight. Weren't they wonderful? Please unmute yourself and give our speakers and panelists a round of applause. Wonderful. Thank you all so much.